My name is Juline Jackson. Welcome all you beautiful moms around America today. It's so much fun for me to kind of, you know, as I'm starting to learn, as we're starting to learn each other, we really do have moms from coast to coast. And it's thrilling that, you know, we're all desiring the same things. We want, you know, a strong family and a strong community, a strong nation. And so we gather together each week and uh, it just, it just makes me happy to know that there are like-minded mamas like us. I am Jaleen Jackson. I'm the National Vice President for Moms for America, where liberty begins at home. When mama understands the miracles of America, the stories of America and reverences this nation and our constitution. When mother knows, her children will know, her grandchildren will know. I have been with Moms for America for over a decade, teaching cottage meetings in my little communities and my neighborhoods and, and attending cottage meetings. And in, inevitably the most important thing that has come from my participation in cottage meetings is that I go home and I teach these things to my husband and I teach these things to my children and I talk about these things with my friends and it helps me to stay anchored in hope because it keeps my eye on God mm -hmm. and on what's most important and on solutions. Thank you so much wow. for all of you that were able to join us last Friday night with Dr. Glenn Kimber. I saw many of the Moms for America on that call. Isn't Dr. Kimber incredible? He I believe is in his 80s now. And what I teach in four hours per each seminar, he teaches in 30 hours. So should you want to take one of his 30 hour seminars uh, on the healing of America, he is a wealth of experience and knowledge and really transformed and changed my life and my husband's life. And so it was kind of fun to uh, work a little bit with him on Friday night. So girls, we're in the second to our last Class. We're on the 15th of our 16th week. When you started these Healing of America seminars, was there a little bit of you that thought, can I really hang in there for yeah. 16 weeks? Anyways, these are um, four, the four seminar manuals. We're on the fourth manual. Remember, you can buy them for $12 at our Moms for America store or at Kimber Curriculum uh, through the Thomas Jefferson Center, and they're your workbooks. Hopefully by now you've filled in all the blanks. We learn best when we have multiple sensories of learning. So we write, we listen, we see, we hear. And next week will be the last class, and then we will take three weeks off, and then we will start up a new round of the Healing America seminars that will take us through the summer. They're 16 weeks. And I would really recommend beautiful ladies taking this class again, because now you're not going to be hearing it for the first time. So it won't quite feel like a fire hose. And so what I teach will sound a little familiar. And what you will do is will compel you to be able to take notes, to take better notes, because now you're, you're familiar with the material that you're hearing. And ultimately these, these workbooks will become kind of your script from what you teach from moving on into the future. I can't tell you how many times in my little family devotional or in a community or a church setting or when I've spoken at places, I've taken my workbooks and I've read and I've taught from these workbooks here. And so knowledge is only ours as, as much as we're willing to give it away. And the truth of the matter is you learn as you teach. So you don't you don't teach, you don't begin to teach when you feel like you're qualified and you're an expert. That's not really the case because no one will ever feel like they're expert enough to teach, you know, certainly these concepts. But as you just begin to teach and have enough of an experience and some little notes, you will be amazed um, what will come from it. And so I love seminar four, it's the last seminar uh, in our series and it's about solutions. You know, everyone is so good these days at identifying problems, isn't that the truth? It's interesting this very morning, I get the Washington Post. I live in Chevy Chase, Maryland, just about 20 minutes from downtown Washington, DC. So I get two newspapers every day, the Post, Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal. And one of the sections of the post today, I don't know if you can see it, the entire section, it's about 12 pages, is on the hundredth, uh, the first hundred days of Joe Biden. And no doubt it's outlined some of the solutions and the things that he's done. And I, I was really <laughs> amazed. I mean, it's an extensive, it's probably 20 pages. 
and um, it's his ideas of solutions. And I think some people might go, it feels more like radical transformation from a progressive a president, but nevertheless, this is his idea uh, of, of moving forward with his first hundred days and beyond. I know when President Trump was in a hundred days, I think there was just an article <laughs> that President Trump got in the post and it was more like a fact checking team from the post that was verifying his faults and misleading claims on his first hundred days. I just had to laugh between the contrast of how they're, they're covering uh, President Biden's first hundred days. But either way, President Trump or President Biden, their solutions have been temporary. And we saw that with how quickly Joe Biden changed President Trump's executive orders and President um, Biden solutions really, as I read through them, are, are temporary. And we're going to talk about how we can heal, heal and make America great permanently. And that will take healing the Constitution. So in seminar one, two, and three, we learned about the Constitution as it was, as it is now, what have caused some of the problems that we're seeing, and how we can be about in seminar four healing uh, this land and, and restoring the constitution. And this woo woo is a big one today uh, because most people don't even, don't even know enough about the constitution to know that parts have been broken and have fundamentally shifted the balance of power. And if they do know something is off with the constitution, they don't have a clue how to begin to fix it. So we have learned in our seminars, uh, particularly seminar three, we need to know how it got destroyed or changed so that we can understand why these relevant amendments that we're gonna talk about today need to be passed. So we're not about just putting band-aids on boilerplates like so many presidents have, just kind of playing whack-a-mole um, with, with the problems with kind of piecemeal legislation or temporary executive orders. We're into long-term solutions. So remember how we talk about, we wanna take a rifle approach, not a shotgun fractured many rounds approach, which just wears us out and burns us out and makes us tired and depressed. We want long-term solutions and that will be repairing, restoring the constitution. So remember a healed constitution is a part of healing the land. So when God says, if you'll turn to me and repent and humble yourself, I will heal your land. He can't heal our land with a broken constitution. And in seminar two, we talk all about the constitution from the viewpoint of the founding fathers and the amendments that have been given since our founders um, have passed and how some of those uh, amendments really have toyed with um, the separation of powers and the balance of power. And we're going to talk about that today. So girls, are we ready? We're in section three of our Restoring the Charter of Freedom, section three, Healing America by Restoring the Constitution back to the tradition of our founding fathers. It will take inspired well-informed leadership of the United States to understand how to do this, how to restore the constitution back to its original strength. And it can be done within four years. Now, in order for this to be successful, it has to be planned and it has to be made popularized amongst the, the people. So the people can then push forward this idea to their elected leaders. Now, if 3% of Americans only through 3% God was able to win the Revolutionary War, use them to, to win the Revolutionary War. 3% of our population today, which is 320 million, would be about 9 million. Do you think we have 9 million people who love our country, love our constitution, love what our founding fathers gave us, and would kind of you, you know, stand up and fight back and, and demand really that our elected leaders you know, have these same feelings. I think, I think we can do it. I think out of 320, I, I dare say, I'm feeling like we can, we can find 9 million. So it's, an, it's in, important to establish in our minds, I, that um, this can be done. Now look, girls, it won't be easy. And it certainly won't be comfortable at times. People will go, what the, what the world are you talking about? You're all wrong. That doesn't make any sense. No, that's not gonna make a difference. 
you have to be willing to be dedicated, kind of like that our founding fathers were willing to place everything they had, their time, their fortunes, their sacred honor to this cause. Remember Thomas Jefferson in 1790 said, we are not expected to be translated from despotism to liberty in a feather bed. And so, you know, I think it's important to be reminded that the conditions that we're facing right now in our nation, and it seems really bad, doesn't it? Seems like these are pretty perilous times, but they're not any more difficult than they were in 1787 when our constitution was first written and went into effect. Inflation back then in 1787 was worse than it was now. There was great disunity uh, amongst the newly formed nation and, and the little states that were acting like little mini nations themselves. There was uh, a threat from powerful enemies from within the country and abroad. Our economy, with, uh, the economy in 1787, 88 was in a deep throes of depression. So if you remember George Washington at that time in history, he said, he wished he had never been involved or seen this disunited states. But despite these challenges, under four years later, under the principles and policies of the Constitution, so the Constitution was adopted, written in 1787, adopted in 1789, and then by 1791, George Washington would go on to say, the United States now enjoys a scene of prosperity and tranquility under the new government that could have hardly been hoped for. And just a few years earlier, he said he was, you know, he, he was sad that he'd even gotten involved in, the, in uh, these disunited states. And so there's hope. So this is kind of where we get this idea that once the constitution is sounded whole, we can heal this land in four years. This is the same dream that we want to see happen again today in, in troubled America. So, woo, where do we begin? Can we really cover this in, in 40, 40 minutes here? In order to be successful in healing of America and restoring the constitution, we have to have some representatives both in the House and the Senate that are kind of a, a, a woke up to this idea and are committed to this task. And this is why it is mamas like you and I and people that love America and that love our constitution have to be vigilant at each election time. So what do we do? Well, we, we participate in meet the candidate nights. We go to the caucuses and the conventions and we watch what the candidates say. And then as, and, and, and all this time now, you're going to be learning as you are right now about the constitution. And so as you, as you go to these evenings, you can ask them questions like, what do you know about the constitution? When, when was the last time you read it? What, what, are, what do you plan to do about the 17th and the 16th amendment that has really disrupted the balance of power and, and no longer you know, allowed the states or the voice of the people to be heard? What are you going to do to restore our local self-government? Tell us, what, how do you feel about Amendment 9 and 10 when they said strong, uh, uh, you know, limited and carefully defined powers in D.C. and the rest of the power should be back to the states? What are you going to do about it? So when you begin to ask them questions like this, you feel empowered and you get enough, enough constituents asking them these kind of questions, then they have to take note. And you will be very mindful of not just who has the best ads or the best billboards, but you will really look for individuals who are honest, meaning they'll uphold the oath of office to uphold the constitution and are good. That means they're godly. So God's law is preeminent in their mind when they're passing laws or proposing laws and are wise. Wise people are wise in the wisdom of our founding fathers. And so in the very back of this um, seminar, there are 49 questions that Cleon Skousen has given um, that you could ask to vet the candidates. They're so good. Take a look at them after our seminar today, 49 uh, commitments that you could ask your elected officials. So now people are going to say, oh my word, uh, there's, there's no way we can restore a constitution. That's impossible. We can't get members of Congress to agree on anything. You know, when was the last time we amended the constitution? That's not gonna happen. Girls, we can't do it. 
we can't do it on our own. It's one of those things that it's going to be a God thing. He just needs us to be willing to learn and to be knowledgeable and to be on that wall, to be the kind of the boots on that ground. So when things get bad enough and people are running to and fro and they don't know what to do, you'll say, hey, I, I've got some solutions here. So we just have to be preparing ourselves and doing these things that we have talked about the last few weeks when it's come to healing of America within our, ourselves, our families, with education, in our communities, in our state. And then when it comes to healing the constitution, we have to understand the constitution, how it got broke and how to fix it. And then somehow, I can't even explain, but God will open up a way for you, for you to share this knowledge that you have with those in positions that can do something about it. Okay, so here we go. Where, where do we begin? Restoring the Constitution and Healing America will take a partnership with elected officials and with the general population. So we need to create an atmosphere that will almost demand restoration of the constitution and we will have some recommended legislation uh, ideas and uh, amendments um, to begin this process. So those elected into office need to understand that we need, look, we need their help. And, uh, and so as, as you know, we talk it up with them, the constituents, they will begin to now think and talk it up with you know, their fellow peers in Congress. And so the constitution must be restored um, in order for us to have a peaceful restoration. This is what we want. We don't want our country overrun. We don't want a civil war. We don't, that, that, that's not what we're looking for. And so it's when enough people in America wake up to their awful situation and kind of have a revival within their soul that I'm gonna put it on the line. I love my country. I want my children to have the freedoms that I had then and enough people start having this experience and learning these things, then they will hold their, you know, politicians feet to the fire and say, we want you to do something about it. Are you humble enough to be taught yourself? I mean, do you love the constitution the way I love it, the way it needs to be loved to re restore this? Because this isn't going to be an easy thing. And so this is why we look to how the founding fathers did it because it would almost seem like it was a miracle what they did. And it is going to take a miracle, but we know girls, God is a God of miracles. So we don't need to, we don't need to fear. Our faith will overcome our fear. So we begin by healing the legislature. Number one, the healing of article one. Remember there's seven articles in the constitution, legislature, legislature, uh, as Sharon Skousen Cray told me, it's not ledge sassar, Jeline, it's ledge sassar, sassar, because we want to sass our, our legislators and kind of rile them up a little bit. So anyways, the founder set up, remember, the House of Representatives to represent the people and the Senate to represent the individual states. And so the senator stood on that wall of protection and he represented the states. But the 17th Amendment took away the authority of the state legislature to appoint the senators. And instead, they made the senators now um, uh, required to be voted in by popular vote, just like the House representatives. And what happened is it resulted in the senators ignoring states' rights. Now they're, they're, they're not concerned about coming home each, each week and reporting to the state legislature who would put them in office and say, look, there's this legislation uh, on the table here in, D in, in Washington, D.C., can we afford it? Do we want to pay for it? Does it is it going to infringe upon the rights of what we want in the state that you know I represent? They don't do that anymore. That's what they used to do until 1913, and then in 1913 we got two terrible amendments that really fundamentally has shifted our country away from limited government. Amendment 16 and Amendment 17, and so now the senators are elected by the popular vote. And so what they try to do is uh, find ways to get money so they can spend money on people directly so they can get reelected. And so remember that three headed eagle in seminar two where uh, the wings of compassion are the two year congressmen. They try and solve as many problems as they can in two years because they only have two years to solve problems. So they, they want money from the government so they can send it, take it home and show the goodies to the people and 
convince them that, oh yeah, we should reelect this guy. Whereas the senators were the wing of resources. They weren't beholden to, you know, the people and all their problems. They were protecting the state. So they would go home to the state legislature, legislators and say, you know, what would be best for our state and preserving the rights of, of the people of this state. So, so that, uh, the wing, the wing of um, resources was shut down. And so both little, the Senate and the House are, are leaning more towards tyranny is, is what happened, a stronger um, centralized Washington DC. And so um, uh, we know in, the, in 1913, the 16th amendment was passed, the 17th amendment was passed all under Wilson Woodrow and also the Federal Reserve was that, that 1913 was a bad year. And, and, and remember how we talked about what the Federal Reserve was in seminar three, and we will talk a little bit about more of that next week in healing our economy. So the destruction of the balance of power was kind of encouraged by the executive branch and even the judiciary branch. And we will talk about that in just a few minutes. So the concern uh, with the state's rights being compromised by the passage of the 17th amendment has meant that the checks and balances established in article one have been weakened and that the Senate senators no longer have the power to protect the states because they're elected by the people instead of the state legislators. So many people in America don't get this. They think, well, of course we should elect our senators, the voice of the people, right? And, and that is the case for our house members. But what it did is it removed when our senators now start started being voted by the voice of the people, it removed that wall of protection that the senators had to protect their states from a runaway federal government that we see exactly what we have now. And really it's not even the people girls that are electing our senators. The first time around, maybe this constituents of the state elect that senator, but the second time around and the third and the fourth and the fifth time around that Senator runs and is elected, he is elected, don't you kid yourself, by special interest money, by PACs, by unions, by master planners, because it takes $16 million on an average to run for the Senate every six years. And these men typically don't come into office with that kind of money and they don't really even have time to fundraise. So they are getting contributions from special interest groups that wants favors from them. So isn't it interesting that 60% of the states in the United States right now, 60% of the states are conservative, are red, so why then aren't 60% of the, why isn't the Senate comprised of 60% Republicans if 60% of the states are Republican? And why is it that there's 27 Republican governors and 23 Democrat governors, but we have more House members and, uh, and you know, the 50, 50 senators that are Democrats? And why is it that there are 23 states in the US that have full control, that are Republicans, 23 Republican states that have full control of their state legislature and their governors. So we have 23 red states versus 15 Democrat states that are run by a Democratic governor and a Democratic full legislature. And we have, follow me, we have 30 um, states that have full control of their just their legislative branch. So maybe the governor is a different party, but there are 30 Republican states that have full control uh, of their legislature and only 18 states uh, that are Democrat that have full control over their legislature. But we still have more, uh, a majority of Democrats in the House. Does that make any sense to you? And we, when we have 50 senators and um, uh, Republican senators and 50 Democratic senators. Shouldn't we have 60% majority in both the House and the Senate at the federal level based on uh, the statistics I've just given you? So that goes to show you it's not, it's not the people that are electing their officials into office. It's the special interest money that are getting hold and allowing, you know, someone to have the best billboards or the best commercials or defame, you know, a, a uh, a candidate well enough that they will win, but it's not necessarily the voice of the people that's being represented at our federal level in Congress. 
And so anyways, those are the concerns with, with the 17th Amendment. So what is the solution? The solution is we repeal the 17th Amendment. We revoke it. So we do that by adding another amendment that will supersede that 17th article or 17th Amendment. So just like we had the 18th Amendment that, um, that prohibited alcohol hall, and then 13 years later, we went put for the 21st Amendment, which repealed uh, that 18th Amendment and said, oh, well, actually, we're going to let the states determine their liquor laws. That's kind of what it looks like to, to change or amend the Constitution. We would put forth a new Constitution, a 28th Constitution, that would repeal the 17th um, Amendment. And so what this would do, would this would just, this, this a new amendment would reestablish the state legislators reelecting the senators like it was before 1913. And it also, uh, we could put a provision in there that would say the senators need to be paid by the individual states. Now, originally the states didn't have enough money to pay senators in, in, when the constitution was first formed. And so the central government has paid the senators from the very beginning. But many believe that if the payment went directly from the states, it would increase the loyalty of the senators to the states. And I love this part, a uh, provision of this uh, new amendment that would revoke the 17th Amendment. It would include a provision that the senators could be voted out of office by a decision of the supermajority of their state legislators. So if the senator is back in DC going rogue, not really representing his state, the, 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 the state legislators back home, if they had a supermajority, which is 60% of the House and Senate, they could vote him out of office. Now imagine those seven senators uh, who voted a couple months ago to remove President Trump, remember from office, there were seven senators. Imagine, do you think they would have done that if they would have had to have gone back home and explained to their conservative states who put them in why they voted to remove, you know, uh, President Trump? Do you think they would have done that? No, they probably wouldn't have because they would have known that that would have sufficiently um, riled the state legislature up that they could have removed them from office, where most of those seven senators just got a little censure, which is just a little slap on the hand because that's all the state legislature can do. They don't have any authority or power to do anything more than that. And so um, once the 17th Amendment has been repealed, a whole litany of problems would be corrected and states' rights would once again become the check on the runaway federal government because our state would now be represented back in Washington, DC and it would decentralize Washington, DC. So it would put the power back to we the people, we the states. And to be honest with you, your state legislator that would be voting in who, what Senator was, was going to represent your state, your state legislator is right in your neighborhood. You see him in restaurants, you see him in Costco, and you can you could say to your state legislator that lives, you know, six minutes away from you, you could show up on his doorstep and say, hey, I'm not happy with what that senator just did. What are you going to do about it? And, and if you don't do something about it, I don't think I'm going to vote for you the next election. And so see, you're closest now, you're, you're, you're closest to the problems. And this is how our founders intended that um, strong local self-government is the best way to solve local problems. And so that would be healing of the, um, the legislature and revoking that 17th Amendment. Okay, now, how do we heal the executive branch? Now, girls... Um, I have recommended in the past watching uh, a YouTube called The Tale of Two Constitutions. Uh, it's, two, it's two little YouTube. One is an eight minute and one is a nine minute. It's called, if you just type in the tale, T-A-L-E of two constitutions and the Thomas Jefferson Center put it out, oh, I don't know, maybe a decade ago, but it helps you to understand this disruption of what happened with the 17th Amendment. And I want to recommend another YouTube. It's only 15 minutes. It's called the most powerful political office in the world. It's a YouTube, just type in the most powerful political office in the world. It's 15 minutes. The Thomas Jefferson Center put this out once again, about a decade ago. And it shows how the executive branch has gotten way bigger than their founders intended. 
And so the executive branch of the United States has become the power center of the world. And these master planners, um, remember Rockefeller, JP Morgan, the Vanderbilts wanted all the power in Washington, DC because it would be easy, easy to get control of just one branch instead of all three branches. And so uh, our master planners today are very real and exist. I mean, I would call them George Soros or a Gates or a Zuckerberg or a Bezos or even Clinton and o Obama. They want, they advocate for a kind of a global or one world government and, and, and kind of centralize the power uh, of America in this executive branch. And so this has been a dangerous threat to um, the US and we have seen presidents, not just Democrat presidents, but presidents of the last really hundred years have abused their office and shattered many of the chains of restrictions uh, which our constitution had originally intended for the federal government. And we've seen the White House and the State Department and other federal agencies impose all kind of abusive authority through the years. So our concern is our presidents are making laws by these executive orders. Now, I'm not going to lie to you, uh, mamas. We kind of liked it when President Trump was issuing so many executive orders. I mean, he was curing problems faster than most presidents I've ever seen in my lifetime. I mean, he was doing Republican things really good and really fast, but his method was the problem because when presidents uh, began to govern by executive orders, really what they're saying is, I, is I, I don't trust the constitution. I don't trust Congress. So I'm just gonna go around that branch of the government and pass my own executive orders uh, through laws. And so here we see uh, President Biden using the same method of, of passing laws through executive order. I mean, good heavenly days. President Biden had been in office 12 hours when he overturned 20 of Trump's executive orders. So, you know, we're not going to heal our country permanently um, by, by these executive orders. So we need to rein them in. We also see some of the concerns with our, uh, you know, over, overcharged, overpowered executive branch is they're using these regulatory agencies to control the country. These decisions uh, within these regulatory agencies were only meant for internal, uh, uh, you know, laws to govern the executive branch, not to externally govern the entire United States. But um, with the passage of the, of the 17th and the 16th amendment, it grew our government. We got all kind of money through that federal income tax of the 16th amendment. And now we have over 500 administrative agencies. And within those we had 2,600 groups and the president is in charge of all of it. And he oversees trillions of dollars of money, both foreign and domestically. And he can, he can haul in a little Senator and Congressman and say, Hey, I will, uh, I will uh, give you your state certain grants and monies if I can get you to vote this way. And guess what? He can manipulate, he can manipulate the votes in Congress that way. And don't you think the president doesn't call in senators? You see all the time, he has groups of senators in his office, in the Oval Office, having a wonderful conversation over tea. And that's exactly what he's doing. And he also, the, um, because he has so much money now because of the federal income tax, he's able to offer grants, federal funds to states that are willing to go along with his programs. Like think of a uh, core curriculum. Remember 10 years ago when Common Core, you know, we didn't want it, but they were, the federal government was dangling all kind of money to states that would accept this, um, this core curriculum and even vaccines, all kind of money is being offered to states now if they will accept vaccine mandates and, and that kind of thing. And so this is not good that our executive branch has this kind of power over the states. So the solution is, blah, 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 drum roll please, is um, to uh, restrict the out of control action of the executive branch by, um, Let's see. First of all, we repeal the 17th Amendment. Okay, check. So we know senators can't be bought or manipulated by the executive branch anymore because it's the state legislature that's, you know, uh, their bread and butter and keeping them in office. And then in addition, we will we will have more constitutionally correct congressmen and women and senators 
so they won't want to abdicate the power to the executive branch because now, hey, they have to come home every weekend and give an accounting to the state legislature. So they're going to be more constitutionally focused instead of, oh, I get to go hang out with the president. Oh, this is going to look really good for my constituents. They're going to think I'm really powerful. That that won't matter to the uh, 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 con Congress members. And then we will establish a constitution that allows executive orders to only apply to the administrative offices of the executive branch of the federal government. In addition, this amendment would remove authority from the administrative agencies to make laws for the entire country. Now, remember in the constitution, in the very first article, it says that only Congress can make laws and only, pe only members of Congress who have been voted or vetted by the United States of America people are allowed, only members of Congress can make laws. And we, we have allowed these agencies to make laws uh, um, and, and that's unconstitutional, really. That was never what the founders intended uh, for all these agencies now to be, be able to bypass Congress and make their own administrative agency laws. And in, in addition to um, this amendment, there would be a provision in this amendment that will prevent uh, the president from issuing agreements with foreign powers. And we have seen that. Remember, we talked about the Yalta agreement with Churchill and um, FDR and it was like, I think it was Stalin, I'm forgetting now. But even, even remember in 2012 when President Obama had that high, hot mic incident where he told the Russian president, Let's just wait until after the election, then we'll be able to work on this missile agreement. They should, the constitution does not allow presidents to have those kind of sidebar conversations. Any agreements that they make with foreign countries has to be ratified in the Senate according to the constitution. And so we would put a provision in there that we, we, they can't have these kind of sidebar agreements with presidents without the, um, uh, the Senate uh, ratifying that. Okay. So on to the 25th Amendment. Remember when we talked about the 25th Amendment, it's dangerous because you could actually get an unelected vice president and vice president. So what has happened with this 25th Amendment? And it was instituted in 1967. What it means is it could short circuit our election process. And we saw it more than ever with President Trump and, and Congress, um, uh, certainly the House and um, Pelosi didn't care for him. And so she tried to remove him through the 25th Amendment. So what you have to do in order to remove a president is you have to convince the vice president that the president is unfit for office. He's sick. He's just sick physically. He's sick in the head, whatever. And if you can convince 51% of the president's cabinet that he's not fit for office, then you can remove him from office. So that would mean eight out of 15 uh, members of that cabinet would have to be convinced, yeah, the president, he's, we, or we just don't like him. We got to remove him. We'll just say he's crazy, he's unfit. And then what, what you would see is we would have a vice president made president, and then she would select her own vice president completely unelected, and they would have 21 days to rule before the Congress could take it up and, and, and see, is he really unfit? Should we really remove you know, President Biden. And so, um, you know, this could be very dangerous uh, and, nef and real nefarious intent for people that, you know, uh, would want to remove a, a president. And so it's just, a, it's a bad amendment. It just needs to be repealed. Okay, the healing of the judiciary, which is article two, the judiciary. Now, remember girls, when our founding fathers formed this country, no nation had ever attempted to make a branch of government uh, solely comprised of the law, the judicial system. But the founders were very worried about, you know, having a runaway federal government like they had seen in England. And so they wanted to assign the Supreme Court uh, re this re awesome responsibility of being the guardian of the law but they didn't exactly know how it was going to work because no country had ever done this before. And, and so they, they, when they formed this third branch of the government, the judiciary, they kind of kept it broad and general terms. Now our founders were worried that they didn't have enough checks and balances on this judiciary. And Thomas Jefferson said exactly that in 1821. 
in this book, The Making of America, which girls is the most comprehensive book I have ever found that explains what our founders meant. Every single article, every single clause, every single section is explained in their words, why they gave us what they did. And he said in The Making of America, the germ of dissolution, this is Thomas Jefferson, of our federal government is in the constitution of the federal judiciary, gaining by day a little, and a, a, a little here today, a little there tomorrow, and working like gravity by night until all shall be usurped from the states. So our founders knew that there could be a potential of the courts becoming too powerful. And that is exactly what we've seen in the last, you know, hundred years, them overstepping their constitutional authority, not guarding the law, but legislating from the bench. And so the concern of this is that the Supreme Court has ceased to safeguard the constitution and all it takes is a majority of five justices to come up with some excuse to dominate national policy. And we as the American people, we have no remedy or recourse to protect us from some of the things that have come down on the bench. And so, um, and secondly, the Supreme Court has usurped some of its authority over the states by uh, using the 14th Amendment now, girls, this will take a little while to really sink in. What is the 14th Amendment? Oh, it was given during Abraham Lincoln's time uh, when we abolished slavery with the 13th Amendment. And the 14th Amendment gave all um, Black citizens citizens' rights instantly, whether you, uh, at the end of the war, and all uh, Black citizens that were born were, were given full citizen rights. And it says that they would have equal protection of the law, just like any other citizen in the country. But what has happened from that equal protection phrase in that 14th Amendment in 1923, the states, the Supreme Court started ruling that the states were now to be beholden to the federal government to ensure that every citizen had equal protection, whether you lived, whether a uh, in Wyoming, they decided this was going to be their level of, you know, morality and, and decency and, and the laws which were going to be acted in Wyoming. But maybe in Massachusetts, let's say, for example, there was gay marriage in Massachusetts. But if you move to Wyoming, there wasn't. And wait a minute, my, my gay marriage is not now recognized in Wyoming. I don't have equal protection of my rights in Wyoming like I do in Massachusetts. So the courts began to misinterpret this 14th Amendment and began to punish the states. And the courts began to determine the standards of decency and morality instead of the states by usurping the state's uh, court's decisions and the, and the state um, legislators laws. And so um, the 14th Amendment was poorly written is, is what it's done. And so we will talk about that in a minute, but this is what the states have began to do is uh, over, uh, overstep their, their uh, bounds uh, and overstep the laws and decisions at the state level. And also um, thoroughly appointment into the Supreme Court has been more like political considerations, not really who's the most qualified uh, or competent. We even have judges today that, are, that sit on the Supreme Court that have never even been judges. And so the solution, ba -ba -da -da, the solution to these problems on the Supreme Court that we have seen, certainly in our lifetime, is create a new amendment to hold the Supreme Court accountable to the Constitution. And, and it would have three provisions. We could call it the Judicial Reform Amendment. And so what that would mean is any decision that the Supreme Court uh, comes down with that the people uh, that's against the original intent of the framers or the constitution, two thirds of the house and the Senate or three fourths of the state legislatures could overrule that Supreme Court decision. Wouldn't that be awesome? You know, like when abortion came, uh, uh, was legalized on the bench, if two thirds or, or three fourths of the state legislatures were like, uh, no, no, we're not gonna have that. And we could strike that decision down. And if uh, the justices tried to bring a similar case like that again, 10, 20 years down the road, that could be grounds for impeachment of that justice. And so now all of a sudden we're, we're holding our justices a little accountable 
to uh, the will of the people and the will of, uh, of the citizens. Another provision of this judicial reform amendment could be that they could not review, review or reverse or vacate or modify the state Supreme Court's decision. So what you do is, you know, if you have a problem with something in the state, you go up through the district level, then the uh, appellate level, and then the state Supreme Court level. But what people are doing is they're saying, well, we don't, we don't, we don't, you know, I'm a man, but I now feel like a woman and I want to be able to run in my state, but I don't like, you know, the decision that I maybe appealed on up to the highest state court. And I don't like that. So I'm now going to appeal to the Supreme Court. And what that has done is, is it's caused the federal system to overrule some of the state's rulings and it's overrun the federal system with cases. And, um, and it's allowed the federal courts to determine a state standard of decency, morality and safety because they're overruling the state's decisions. And that's not what our founders intended. And so we'd have a provision saying that they couldn't overrule a state Supreme Court decision. And lastly, we would say that um, any justice has to have at least five years of judicial experience or at least three years on a state Supreme Court or in the federal court system and they can't serve for more than 15 years. Just put some limits on them. It's interesting to know that Ruth Bader Ginsburg, she served for 27 years and died at 87. Now I dare say she probably should have stepped down a decade earlier, but because there's no restrictions on what qualifications the justice has to have and how long they can serve, I think sometimes we get into trouble with some of these justices that just refuse to step down because they don't wanna lose the court. So it's interesting girls right now, we're hearing rumors about President Biden wanting to pack the court, increase the justices. We have nine justices right now. He wants to um, increase it to 13 so that there would be a more of a, a liberal majority. So he wants to add five more justices. Now in the constitution in article three, it doesn't stipulate how many justices we can have on the Supreme Court. So when the, when the country was first formed for the first 75 years, first they had six justices, then they are like, wait a minute, we need, a, we need an odd number. So they brought it down to five justices, then they, they said that's too few. So they moved it up to seven justices. And then in 1869, they decided on nine justices. So it's been uh, what, 150 years, we've been at nine justices. Now, in 1937, FDR, Franklin Roosevelt, um, tried to increase, he tried to pack the court because he wanted the court to be sympathetic to all of his New Deal programs, but uh, that legislation was rejected. But they did pass a bill in 1937 that uh, if a bill is passed by Congress that they think might be unconstitutional, the attorney general for the United States can appeal to the Supreme Court to review this legislation. Um, but just imagine um, if you know we were able to pass this legislation that would increase the justices to 13 like Biden is hoping, President Biden's attorney general, I can guarantee you, would not appeal to the Supreme Court asking if this is constitutional, that wouldn't be the case. But our saving grace about packing the courts will be that there's not enough votes in the Senate to get that legislation passed. Because even though there's 51 votes, because Kamala Harris would be the 51, you need a 60 vote um, from the senators to stop a filibuster. Um, and so, uh, and we already have two Democratic senators, Manchin from West Virginia and another uh, lady, I don't, I forget her name, who's a Democrat, have said they will not vote for um, increasing the Supreme Court. So they just don't have the votes to get that legislation on the floor to be voted on because of the filibuster rule where you have to have 60 senators to move uh, legislation forward and a vote to be taken on the Senate floor in Washington, DC. 
but it is interesting how President Biden is, is kind of trying to, you know, get those little rumblings about increasing our Supreme Court. But right now, legislatively, he could not do that. OK, ladies, we're coming into the finish line. I know today is kind of heavy duty constitutional stuff, and it, and it might feel like it's hurting your brain a little bit. That it's not quite as interesting. But girls, you have to have kind of a working knowledge of what is wrong and what are some solutions here to just kind of throw some of these solutions out to people, uh, candidates or, you know, people that the state legislators that might be able to do something about this. So we need to clarify, we need to clarify the Bill of Rights and the related amendments. Originally, states established the Bill of Rights as an amendment. We know the Bill of Rights is the first 10 amendments that our founders gave us. They established this Bill of Rights as a means to restrict the federal government from becoming too involved in the states. It was kind of, this Bill of Rights was to be an umbrella of protection uh, from a runaway government. And the preamble to the Bill of Rights even says further, um, we have adopted, uh, uh, um, let's see, what does it say? In order to prevent misconstruction or abuse of powers, further declaratory and restrictive clauses have been added. And they were, these were supposed to be the chains on the federal government, not the chains on the states. But it's, 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 um, it's with the 14th Amendment, we're now chaining the states. And with the 17th Amendment, we're chaining the states now. And uh, there's this uh, wonderful quote by um, M.J. Sobrand. He was a colonist for the um, uh, American, American Law or American Review magazine. Yeah, that's, and he was known as one of the finest col um, colonists. When I say colonist, writing a, a colon, colon, Colonist. I'm not saying that word right, but uh, you know what I mean. Um, so anyways, he wrote uh, that, look, Congress made a law respecting the establishment, forbidding Congress, the First Amendment, forbidding Congress to establish religion. They didn't want a state religion like they had in England, but they also forbade Congress to abridge the free exercise of religion. Thus, giving actual religious observance a rhetorical emphasis that fully accords with the special concern that they had for religion. We know they, they had great reverence and respect for religion. They knew this country, this Republic couldn't be maintained without religion, without a morally strong and virtuous people. And that came from being religious, but they wanted the States to be able to determine how they were gonna practice and establish their religion. They didn't want the federal government. They didn't want to happen what they saw in England. And so what has happened though, secularists as the courts now begin to remove God from the schools and remove Bible reading and remove prayer and that kind of thing. They have actually, um, secularists have tried to equate acting on religion as establishing religion. So we see the poor little baseball or the football coach in Washington being fired because he prays with his little football team on the field after the game. They, the Supreme Court has ruled that as establishing religion, not acting upon Upon religion. And so what we see, another educator said, look, the founding fathers wanted religion to be free to make its own way in these states for them to determine how morality, religion, and decency was going to be practiced. But neither did they intend to have irreligion made into a favored state church, meaning a national church. And that's what we're seeing. Irreligious ideas are being codified and protected more than religious ideas. And so um, the Supreme Court has since interpreted the 14th Amendment as overriding this provision uh, and placed upon the states the same restrictions that the founders placed upon the federal governments. And so what we need to do here is we need uh, an amendment, the solution to keep the federal government out of the matters which only belong to the states an amendment which uh, should be passed that would clarify the restrictions imposed upon the fifth and the 14th amendment called due process. And if I had time, we would talk about what due process is, but we talked about it in seminar two. And, and really it's just, you know, look, we're entitled to life, liberty and property for, for someone who's being accused of a crime in the courts uh, with the fifth amendment. 
but then they took that due process clause and put it in the 14th amendment. And then they misinterpreted and misaligned that due process now to, that was the means by which they used to legalize gay marriage in 2013. So you can see they've misrepresented the intentions of this due process and this equal protection. So what we need to do is we need to pass a new amendment that keeps the federal government out of the matters which belong to the states uh, and um, we also need to clarify uh, what that 14th Amendment meant and clarify the 10th Amendment that uh, does not allow the federal government to become involved in the internal operations of the state. Remember that the 10th Amendment says only limited and carefully defined powers are delegated to the government. All others should be retained to the states and the people to figure out, you know, set their own standards of religion and how it should be exercised in morality and decency and safety. Okay, so girls, woo, we did it. You now know how to restore the constitution of the United States. So just as a little review here, so, so you can organize it in your brain. We repeal the 17th amendment. So we would make a 28th amendment. We pass a new amendment that will clarify the powers of the president, shrink his that executive branch. We would repeal the 25th amendment, which says, you know, we can say a president's crazy to remove him from office. We just get rid of that amendment. We pass a judicial reform amendment, which two thirds of the, uh, the Congress or three fourths of the state legislators could overrule a bad judgment by the Supreme Court. We pass an amendment to clarify the 5th and the 14th Amendment, thus establishing the Bill of Rights to its in original intent to chain the federal government, not to chain the states. And next week, we're going to talk about one more that we would repeal, and that's the 16th Amendment, which, which um, allowed uh, for the federal government to tax us directly. We would repeal that as well. So girls, remember only 85% of the constitution uh, or 85% of it is intact. Only 15% uh, has been broken. So by passing these relevant amendments, we could restore the constitution with its inspired, well-informed uh, and, and with inspired and well-informed leaders, we could, we could do it. And primarily we want our congressmen to understand what it will take because they would be the ones proposing these amendments. Or if Congress doesn't wake up in remember the fifth article on how to amend the constitution, if two thirds of the states would, would get, uh, rally together, we could just bypass Congress altogether. Congress doesn't like it when we do this. It's called the constitutional convention. They don't like that. But we need to have inspired leaders that will have the courage to go, okay, to long-term uh, heal this land and, and repair this constitution. This is what we're gonna popularize and we're gonna educate the people or maybe the people get educated and then they hold you know, their legislators to, to the fire and we educate them. But this is what would heal most of America. Remember it only took four years in the early history of our country and so it would probably take about four years if we, if we could use that same pattern. And remember, the healed constitution is a part of God healing our land. And the whole purpose of this inspired constitution that our founder said was struck off by the hand of God was to protect our rights and the rights of our family from a runaway government so we could have life and liberty and we could decide how we wanted to live and whose laws and, and our morals and our standards of decency in our communities. When women, it will be you women, when they see this protection, protective umbrella of the constitution being removed and when we begin to feel these fiery darts penetrating into our homes of godless education, of immoral legislation and bad court decisions, which have spawned this whole cancel culture society and censorship and um, corrupt elections and forced COVID mandates and all kinds of things we don't like right now. When we feel these fiery darts pen penetrating into our homes and onto our children and our grandchildren, this is when we begin to wake up and we wake up other people around us who we love to action. Now girls, I understand, you're probably thinking, oh my gosh, is, can this really happen? 
you're right. This is too big for you and me to heal the constitution, restore it. But with God, nothing is impossible. So we keep our little family close. We restore, we repair those relationships. If we're on the outs with some of our kids, because, you know, they're, you know, they voted for this person or they're spouting this crazy, you know, don't have that alienate or hurt that relationship. Keep them close. Love on them. Make family time a high priority, even if they have some different ideas and opinions. And then you keep learning and you keep studying the Constitution from the viewpoint of the founders and what they gave us. I'm not going to lie to you girls. It's going to take a lot. I've been at this 12 years. I'm still studying it. It is still, I still have to study in order to really understand. Cause I forget if I don't, if I'm not talking about it enough, I kind of forget. So we have to keep at it. We have to keep um, explaining it to our husband and to our children and to our sisters. And, and we have to keep hunting for good politicians that love the constitution and that are humble enough to be taught these ideas. To me, learning the constitution, Constitution and, and really writing it on my heart is equivalent to studying the scriptures, studying the Bible. I just don't read a chapter one time and go, okay, yeah, I know that story. I never need to. I have to keep reading and studying scripture and the Bible every single day to really begin to understand how it applies to me and how it can change me and how it can help my relationship in my marriage or with my children. And so, you know, this is kind of like your your part as we keep studying and we keep learning and we might, you know, reteach it. We might start a little cottage meeting in our neighborhood. And, um, and so next week, girls, we're on our class, last class. It's going to be a party. <laughs> We've done it, girls. We're going to talk about how we can heal the economy and deregulate America at home and abroad. Ooh, that sounds kind of heavy, but I think it's going to be interesting. At this point, I think we're kind of interested in this stuff. So we will have one class, our last class next week, then we're going to have three weeks off, and then we're going to start back up again on June 2nd. Girls, I would really ask you to make it a matter of prayer who you could share this Healing of America experience with. It's free. All they have to do is go sign up, get their little manuals. You can kind of bear a personal testimony of it. You've been through it. So think about what friends or, you know, neighbors or church ladies or, you know, relatives that you would want to invite. And, um, and so that is what we have moving forward. And girls, I promise you, as you learn the stuff and relearn it, God is going to be able to use you in a unique way because you now know something that most mamas and grandmas don't that are worried that are running to and fro. And they just think the country's going to pot that, you know, it's just like, it's over and you're going to, you're going to stay anchored in hope and you're going to be able to share with them some, some ideas, some solutions, and you will be a light unto people that come into uh, contact with you and your home will be a, a stabilizing foundational place to be. And so you're going to see a change begin to happen. Maybe you've already felt it within yourself and you will be a force to be reckoned with and God will use you in miraculous ways. And so anyways, okay, girls, that's the end of our class. <laughs>